Welcome back to the Hard Run Box News Corner. As you might have seen, yes, we pulled yesterday's video due to content idea related stuff. You can read more about that decision in a post we made on the YouTube community tab. And if you're still interested in our thoughts on OLED displays, the review is available on TechSpot or as an edited version for our patrons. Links to both of those will be in the description below. Bit of a mess, but we're moving on. It's News Corner time, and there have been plenty of interesting developments this week to discuss. Perhaps the biggest story from this week is the first look at Intel's upcoming 10 nanometer Ice Lake CPUs. Yep, we're not living in a crazy alternate reality. 10 nanometer chips will actually be shipping in a wide variety of systems come the holiday season of this year. However, the first batch of processors will be confined to just low power SKUs for ultra portable laptops in both the U and Y series. Intel haven't been talking about high performance 10 nanometer chips just yet. It's unclear whether we'll even get consumer desktop 10 nanometer in this generation. So for now, all of the 10 nanometer focus will remain on low power processors. Yesterday, we got the first official reveal of the product stack that will be used in laptop and low power designs later this year. And boy, is the naming scheme, well, it's not great. In fact, it's terrible, if I'm honest. In the U series, we have six chips, five of which can be configured to run at either 10 watts or 25 watts, depending on what the OEM wants. And the sixth chip, the highest end one, runs at 28 watts and will be reserved for premium designs. Intel says that chip is coming later. But anyway, look at some of these product names. At the top, we have the Core i7 1068G7, then the Core i7 1065G7, then there's three Core i5 1035s with various G designations, and at the bottom, a single Core i3. Now, when you break it down, I'm sure these names make sense to Intel, but I reckon there are a few too many letters and numbers here to make sense to a regular user. It's interesting Intel has gone with 1000 series branding here as opposed to 10,000 series for 10th gen, which would have been an even bigger mistake, but I think a bit of the confusion comes by tacking G7, G4, or G1 onto the end. Of course, those G suffixes do relate to something important, and that's the new Gen 11 graphics capabilities of the system. The top end chips are branded with G7. That indicates the full 64 execution units are available, delivering the best GPU performance. But it doesn't relate to clock speeds. As you can see, the Core i5 1035G7 has a 1050 megahertz clock compared to 1100 megahertz for the Core i7 G7 chips. Core i7 G7, what a time to be alive. <laughs> then we get G4, which is a 48 EU design and G1 which comes with 32 execution units. On top of this each chip has its own GPU branding so the G7 and G4 processors have Iris Plus graphics while G1 is UHD graphics. I guess the good news is even the lowest end G1 design still has more execution units than the standard UHD graphics GPUs from the previous generation which topped out at 24. As for the CPU design there are also very interesting things here. Everything but the Core i3 is a 4 core 8 thread design so the same as current gen Whiskey Lake CPUs. Level 3 cache is also the same with 8 meg, 6 meg, and 4 meg for Core i7, Core i5, and Core i3 respectively. But it's the CPU clock speeds that are a bit unusual. The base frequencies are quite low in the 1.0 to 1.3 gigahertz range, except for the 28 watt part, which pushes that up to 2.3 gigahertz. And for the 15 watt chips, the maximum boost frequency on a single core taps out at 3.9 gigahertz, or just a 3.5 gigahertz all core clock. This is quite a bit lower than with Whiskey Lake built on 14 nanometer, which offers a 4.6 gigahertz single core and 4.1 gigahertz all core in something like the popular Core i7-8565U, which isn't even the highest chip in that lineup. Of course, in practice, these chips are power limited and don't run at the listed clock speeds for very long, but on face value, we're looking at a 600 to 700 megahertz decrease in clock speeds, moving from 14 nanometer to 10 nanometer in the same power envelope. There's also a Y series with parts that can be configured between 9 and 12 watts. Again, we have quad cores for the Core i7 and i5 CPUs, plus dual core Core i3 models. But this time, we're looking at even lower base clocks, as low as just 0.7 gigahertz for the Core i5 1030G4 with boost clocks in the mid 3 GHz range. Despite this, Intel is still offering up to G7 graphics with 64 execution units in the top end Y series chips. You'll also notice there is no U or Y distinction between these product lines and no Core N3 branding like we used to see with some of the previous Y series chips. The only distinction is in the final number, zero being Y series at 9 watts like the Core i5 1030G7, 
5 being 15 watts like the Core i5-1035G7, and 8 being 28 watts like the Core i7-1068G7. Again, sounds a bit confusing to me. Now while these 10th gen CPUs and Ice Lake do wind back clock speeds relative to Whiskey Lake, we are looking at a new microarchitecture this time, not just a Skylake revision. So we have an updated CPU core design, support for new instructions like AVX512, and of course the much beefier GPU to go along with it. Overall, Intel are touting a median IPC gain of 18% over Skylake, but when factoring in clock speed differences, the overall performance advantage shrinks to just 3.7% or so over Whiskey Lake, going on Intel's numbers. But we don't just have Intel's numbers, Anantec has a fantastic article where they were able to benchmark an Ice Lake system against Whiskey Lake to see how it stacks up. I'm not going to show many of the benchmarks here, go support Anantec and all their hard work if you are really interested, but the general consensus seems to be that Ice Lake and Whiskey Lake will trade blows. Sometimes Ice Lake will be faster if it can take advantage of new instructions or IPC gains, but a lot of the time it's roughly equivalent and sometimes it's even slower. As for gaming, well, naturally this seems to be a huge improvement given the much larger GPU that's included. Often an Antec saw double the performance of Whiskey Lake, which should make Ice Lake quite competitive, if not faster, than AMD's Ryzen Mobile APUs, which also have much larger GPUs than Intel's previous 15 watt designs. Gen 11 also introduces support for variable rate shading and adaptive sync, which is really neat. Overall, I think this will be a really interesting generation for Intel. It doesn't look like we'll be getting mad performance uplifts with Ice Lake on the CPU side, given the frequency constraints with 10 nanometer, which will also explain why Intel don't appear to be working on high performance CPUs on this node yet. But there is a chance Ice Lake will be more efficient at similar performance levels, which is crucial for laptop form factors where these CPUs are designed for. We'll just have to see how that one pans out and also we're getting a much beefier gpu which is always nice to see there's definitely a lot more to say on 10 nanometer and what intel is doing here but i think i'll leave that for when i get my hands on actual systems at launch and i can do some testing myself Lots of discussion on 10 nanometer. let's move on to something else. AMD CEO Lisa Su has sort of confirmed that high-end Navi is a thing. During the Q&A portion of AMD's second quarter results, uh, someone asked AMD to give us a sense on 7 nanometer high high-end Navi and mobile 7 nanometer CPUs. Lisa Su responded by saying, you asked a good product question, I would say they are coming. You should expect that our execution on those are on track and we have a rich 7 nanometer portfolio beyond the products that we have already announced in the upcoming quarters. Now, as with all these vague statements, there are many ways to interpret this, but it does sound like both high-end Navi and mobile 7 nanometer CPUs are coming and are on track, which is nice to know. I think everyone was expecting that both these products would eventually come, although with the GPU side and AMD often stopping in the mid to upper mid range with their products in the last few generations, it's great that it seems high-end Navi will become a reality, it's just a matter of when. Another interesting story emerged this week on the AMD side relating to their new chipset drivers for Ryzen 3000. There's been lots of confusion in the AMD Ryzen community about various perceived issues with Ryzen CPUs, such as running as high as 1.5 volts in some workloads, not being able to idle, and so on. AMD has released a big document explaining a lot of this stuff alongside a chipset driver that improves some of the situation. The first thing AMD has tackled is the appearance of CPUs not idling. This was occurring because Ryzen processors can modify their clock speed selection in as quickly as one millisecond intervals. So often a monitoring software polling the CPU for its frequency would be interpreted as a workload and the CPU would boost its frequency to return the reading to the software. So while the CPU is actually, generally speaking, idling, it's effectively micro-boosting to deliver results to monitoring software. AMD has tweaked that with chipset driver 1.07.29. Now at low or idle loads, Ryzen 3000 CPUs will modify their clock speeds at a more standard 15 millisecond interval. This won't trigger boost behavior for things like monitoring software that a user might have in the background, which as AMD says, filters undesirable boost requests and keeps the CPU more dormant in light workloads. AMD has also raised the minimum frequency in low or idle workloads to 99% on the base clock, which keeps the CPU on a razor's edge so that your non-trivial workloads can easily trigger CPU boost. This means that your Ryzen 3000 CPU will idle at a higher clock speed, but this is now normal. The crucial thing to note is these changes shouldn't affect performance because the CPU will still control its frequency selection at one millisecond intervals while boosted. And remember, Ryzen CPUs are in a boosted state under any moderate to high performance workload like productivity tasks, web browsing, and gaming. Idle and low load only really refers to background and intermittent tasks, so AMD is effectively stopping background tasks from triggering boost while still keeping important workloads performing as expected. 
Now we say it shouldn't affect performance, we haven't actually tested this, but Anantec is showing that the changes mean Ryzen 3000 now takes 17 milliseconds instead of one millisecond to ramp up from base to boost clocks, which is still very fast and really shouldn't affect performance all that much. Plus you still get one millisecond ramping while in boost. If you want the previous behavior for whatever reason, switch from the Ryzen balance to performance power profiles. For those with Ryzen 3000 CPUs, it's probably worth reading the whole document, but there's a few other interesting things in here. The latest chipset driver includes a beta solution for the problem where Destiny 2 couldn't be launched. They also talk about how voltages of 1.5 volts during load is normal and could be a surprise for people coming from other CPUs, but it is how Ryzen is designed, so that's standard behavior. And finally, there's been a few changes to Ryzen Master, which improve how temperatures and voltages are reported. So overall, pretty interesting situation going on there with the chipset drivers. Couple of quicker topics to blast through. First one is that Nvidia has finally lifted a restriction that prevented owners of consumer GeForce graphics cards from using 30-bit color with professional software like the Adobe Suite. This is one of the main reasons to get a professional GPU over a GeForce card for video and photo editors if you were sticking with the Nvidia ecosystem. The latest Nvidia Studio drivers that are optimized for a variety of workstation and creative apps now includes 30-bit color support. You'll still need a 10-bit display to take advantage of 30-bit color, but I'm glad you can now do this with NVIDIA's more affordable GeForce cards for prosumer content creators. And finally, ASRock has confirmed that their custom Navi designs will be released in the second week of August, at least according to a Reddit post, which is hopefully true. We've heard these custom Navi cards will be available in August to September for some time, so it all makes a bit of sense. Shouldn't be too long before they're here. That's it for this week's News Corner. Subscribe to get this content in your inbox every week. Consider supporting us on Patreon. Like the video if you enjoyed it. I'll catch you in the next one.